Hello, welcome to the fourth webinar in our quality control series. Today we're talking about selecting the right talenting method. Once again, presenting is Tim Mao, our Applications Engineering and Technical Support Manager at XY Pantone. I'm Robert Grotans, the Global Technical Marketing Manager, and I'll be moderating today's webinar. If at any time during this webinar you have any questions, please feel free to use the questions form to submit your questions. We will be sure to follow up with you after the webinar. So with that, I'll turn it over to Tim to get things started. Thank you, Robert, and welcome everyone. Let's dive into selecting the right tolerance method, or as I say in my subtitle, um, is it good enough or not? That's really what tolerancing is all about. So let's begin. So tolerancing, a color, color tolerancing can be done with a large variety of methods, and that may be prescribed to you um, depending on what it is you're making and your customer's requirements and so forth. But ultimately, agreement to visual is key. Um, we need to be able to validate that our color is gonna look good. Um, so why not just use visual only? Well, there are some really good reasons for that. I'm gonna show you one really quick here. Um, in this picture, are A and B the same color? Well, every person who looks at that says there's no way those two um, squares labeled A and B are the same color, but the reality is that they really are the same color. Um, and the point we're trying to make here, it's really easy to fool our eyes. Um, and we've listed a number of things there, I'm not gonna go through them all, but a um, number of reasons that can fool our eyes into seeing color um, maybe not uh, in agreement with reality. So our eyes have some limitations, but visual is still the ultimate method. Why? Because when we all go shopping um, for anything, whether it's a car or a can of soup, we look at color um, and we assess color. And so it's very important that the color is right. So visual is, is important, but there's other things we can do as well. So let's dive a little deeper. So some typical tolerance methods. There are people who do visual only. Um, they're probably putting things in a light booth like this, um, but most people are moving beyond that because of all the limitations to vision, um, the variation between different people and so forth. And so many people, many customers of ours um, in, in a wide variety of industries are using the other equipment you see there, um, maybe a benchtop spectrophotometer, um, or they're looking at software um, in combination with that. So they might be doing visual only, um, or if they're doing a measured thing, then they're probably using something like this. Um, either LAB, which gives me a tolerance that's got a green, um, kind of a square pass-fail. Um, they might be using LCH, um, which you can see kind of rotates that tolerance. It's not perpendicular to the sides any longer. Or maybe they're using an elliptical tolerance. Now you'll notice in the words above that there's some percentages listed there. Those are roughly how well those tolerance methods agree with human vision. So with LAB, 75% of the time, if it says pass, it'll look good to you. If it says fail, it won't look good to you. That means 25% of the time, your eyes and the numbers might disagree. With LCH, that's at 85% with elliptical tolerances like Delta E CMC, DE94, DE2000, um, that's 95 to even 98%. And we're gonna talk in this webinar about how we get those numbers, those percentages as high as we possibly can. Because there's a number of different ways to do that. So let's talk about tolerancing um, using an instrument and software. So we're going to apply a tolerance and assess the results. And we're gonna start with this. So I'm gonna have in this particular example, I'm using Delta E CMC. It's one of the elliptical tolerances. My pass fail is set to 1.00, meaning anything less than one passes, anything more than one fails. And here's a list of six orange samples labeled one through six that I've measured. And you can see their DECMC, um, third or second column from the right. Um, and in red, if they fail, like 1.02 and 1.11, and in black, if they passed, um, they're not red, indicating that there's a problem. Now I can also plot them on a on a um, color plot like this. And again, we see the ellipsoid. We see 
where, where acceptability is. We see where failure is. You might look at that and go, wait a minute, I've got red dots in the middle of the tolerance. Yes, they're red because remember, all of our tolerancing is three-dimensional and those two dots that are almost dead center um, of the crosshairs there are also the two red dots that are outside if you look to the right where the L scale is being judged. They're either too light or too dark. So on, in a three-dimensional sense, they're out of the tolerance. So we have a way of tolerancing things, of looking at them, knowing their pass or their fail. If this is the tolerance my customer has set or that we've um, landed on, I can use this and very quickly I know it's a pass or it's a fail. Now, it's very common that you'll have a customer suggest or require a specific tolerance for you. It's also common that you can find colors that might fall outside of the tolerance that even the customer will accept visually, um, or things that fall inside the tolerance that are inside the limits they specified for you, yet they still reject them because visually they're not acceptable. So both of those things happen, false positives and false negatives, if you will. Um, so how do we deal with that? Because we can set a tolerance and go with it, that's great, but how do we deal with this if there are some of these that the customer wouldn't necessarily agree with that? So I'm gonna walk you through that process. This is called tuning your tolerance to your customer. So what if I pass my tolerance but the customer still, re still rejects it? So first step if that happens is this. Ensure that the same parameters are being used by everyone. So don't, don't assume anything. Um, hopefully all of this is documented very well. But it's not just about the tolerance metrics, the second bullet there, but are we all using the same lighting for, if we're doing visual or illuminant if we're doing math, um, measured um, tolerancing, right? Are the instrument geometries the same? Are the settings the same? Are we measuring the same place? You know, all of those things, we've got to make sure that those are all equal. Assuming that they are, now, if I'm still getting disagreement, it's, maybe it's time to reassess the tolerance being used. And the way we do that is this. We're going to adjust the tolerance to meet customer expectations, because ultimately that's what you're after. So there's two big things we're going to do here. First one is build a tolerance on real samples. The easiest way to do this is to get your hands on some samples that are good and some are bad. And hopefully, they're good and bad based either on your visual assessment or even better based on your customer's visual assessment because their assessment might be different than yours. So if I've got a series of samples from my customer that they've approved and a series that they have not approved, that's what I need to do this. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to measure them. And I'm going to evaluate them to determine what really are their limits. They might have said their tolerance was one but maybe they accept things bigger than one, or maybe they accept, only accept things that are le um, at 0.9. If I have samples that I know are good and bad, I can make this assessment. So here's how we do it. So we've measured them in, okay? It's the same six samples we measured before, and we've got them sitting there. Now, let's assume in this example that the, the customer actually approved samples one and four. Sample one has a delta E CMC of 1.02. Sample four has a delta E CMC of 1.04. If they visually accepted those, then what happens if I simply come in here and change my tolerance from 1.0 to 1.05? Okay. Well, instantly those two things now pass. So I have adjusted my tolerance to get agreement with my customer. Now, granted, my sam six samples here, probably not enough samples to be um, successful in doing this work, and maybe it's a bit oversimplified, and you won't always find a good <laughs> clean break where everything under a certain number passes and everything over fails. You might find that you have two or three that are really close to each other numerically, and one they like and one they don't like, but you can do this kind of work and adjust the size of your tolerance to agree with what looks good visually to your customer. That gets you closer and closer to always making sure that you're shipping quality product that will pass their, their tolerance.
So that's the first thing we can do to help improve our agreement with customers and our success rate. The second one is this, making your tolerance actionable. And what do we mean by that? Well, it's really important for us to understand that the difference between good and bad is not a knife edge. In other words, if my tolerance was still at 1.00, I had samples that were at 0.99 and they passed. Well, that's awful close to 1.00 and nobody can see the difference between 0.99 and 1.00. Human beings don't have the ability to see that kind of color difference. So let's look at a different set of samples. Here we've got a whole bunch of them. Um, and you'll see a variety of DECMCs that range anywhere from, what, 0.28 to 4.67, okay? Well, it's pretty obvious that 4.67 fails, and I don't need to worry about it. And it's pretty obvious that 0.28 is going to pass and 0.04 is going to pass. But what about there's a couple of them, like the first one, that's at 0.99. Well, is that really passing? or do I need to go visually assess that one myself to make sure that it passes? So here's what we can do. We can set the tolerance to alert you when your color is drifting toward failure. So in our IQC software, we have this thing where we can set my default tolerance. We've seen this before, pass fail is 1.0, but here I've set in what's called a margin percent at 0.2 or 20%. That means when I apply this, anything that's only with that's with a sorry with a pass fail tolerance of one, 20% means from 0.8 to one. That's going to be my margin. And here's what happens when I apply that. I get this yellow area. Um, you'll see that on the left hand side next to each sample, there's either a yellow dot, a red dot, or a green dot. Well, the yellow dot means it's in the margin. A green dot means it passes and a red is a fail. If I set up a margin like this, now my operators can simply take a measurement. If they get a pass, you don't have to worry about it because that means it's at 0.8 or less in this scenario, meaning it's a long ways away from the edge of the tolerance. It's gonna look good, it's gonna be good. I don't have to do any other assessment. If I get a fail, obviously it fails. It's outside the, 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 the tolerance. But if I get one that says margin and it's yellow, I wanna go visually assess that because it means I'm getting close to failure. I'm not failing yet, but I'm getting close and I need to look at that. And maybe I need to assess what's happening in production. You know, am I, as my color starting to drift, going from pass to margin, that means I do something before I really get to a failure place. That's what making a tolerance actionable is all about. And then one last comment. Lots of people are using a Delta E kind of tolerance. Delta E CMC, Delta E 94, Delta E 2000, even C Lab Delta E with LAB or with LCH. When you're doing that, those are great for pass and fail, but that one number doesn't tell you what's wrong when you fail or what's drifting when you start to move from pass to margin. So always use your color space delta values, meaning the delta LAB or LCH, whichever you prefer, use those values to help tell you, what do I gotta fix? What's wrong with this color, you know? If I look down at the one um, second, from, second from the bottom, for example, right? Um, it has a delta ECMC of 1.99. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, it's 2.8 units lighter, it's 1.7 units redder and it's one and a half units yellower. Okay, that thing's got lots of problems, right? The one right above it, 0.98 delta E CMC is in the margin. It's almost dead on for A and B or C and H, whichever you prefer, but it's 2.4 units lighter. Okay, I, if I have a means of darkening that sample slightly, I can make it much closer because it's almost all a lightness difference. That's why we want to focus on those delta values to help us know what should we fix. So to summarize what we've just gone through, tolerancing is about selecting a tolerance type that agrees with your customer's assessment of your products and meets their needs and create SOPs, written documentation of how you're going to do the tolerance. Secondly, we want to use margins to alert you when your color is trending toward failure. 
let it warn you that you start that your what looks good is maybe starting to not look quite so good and you need to take some action. And then third, we want to use the three-dimensional color metrics to help direct you in correcting your color issues. So that is our take on tolerancing for today. As Robert mentioned, we're going to um, give you just a bit of time here to use the questions panel. Um, if you have some questions, please feel free to post those questions in the question panel, and we will get back to you with answers just as quickly as we can. With that, we'll leave you a little time to answer, ask any questions that you have, and thank you for your time.